the internet went wild with an eight hour long series from a woman named Risa on TikTok who was documenting her crazy marriage. So look, if you're anything like me, I, I gotta know, we gotta know what's in here. Please excuse the hair, but here is part one of who the did I marry? So I met my ex-husband around March 4th of 2020. We met on Facebook dating site okay. and we also matched on hinge i did not realize that he, he was on both um under two different <gasps> names so one was his actual name and the other one was a variation like a nickname if a friend matches with a guy on two different apps that's one thing but if they match with the guy on two different apps and the guy has a different name and profile, but then if he calls you out on it first and says, oh, what? You didn't even notice that you had already matched with me? Then he normalizes it because otherwise it would have been so weird if he didn't call it out first. We met around March 4th. We exchanged phone numbers. He called me and we talked on the phone um, for the first time. In the first phone call, he told me that he had just moved to Georgia from California, from San Diego. Okay. His job had transferred him um, because he was being transferred in as the new regional manager for a major condiment company that is based here in Georgia. Both of his parents were deceased. This is the first phone call. Uh -oh. Both of his parents were deceased. His father um, was a Philadelphia police officer. His mom was a teacher. Also in that phone call, he explained to me that he um, used to play football. He explained that he used to play arena football. I know nothing about arena football. Um, I know about NFL. I know about college. Go dogs! But I don't know anything about arena football. So he explained to me that he used to play arena football. He used to work at Apple in the off season of arena football. I don't know anything about arena football. And I believe I did tell him that I don't know anything about arena football. Okay. That'll come into play later on. He told me, you know, I just I just moved here. Um, my job is paying for my housing, be and they are helping me to look for a house. He was like, I don't really know too too many people here because I spend all my time at work, and you know, this job is really demanding. God, this is not good so far. Normal guy, you know, he's got brothers and sisters, moved over here for a job at a condiment place, came from California, came to Atlanta, met him on the Christian page, the Facebook page, the day. Yeah, he's just trying to make some friends. This is great. Where do we go? That was our first phone call. We talked more. He talked a lot, which took me by surprise because I'm not really used to men talking more than me. Oh, true. Um, he eventually asked me out on a date. Our first date was set Wait, for also, Saturday. Keep in mind, she did an eight hour series on this where she just talks to the camera nonstop. And you telling me that he was talking more than her? Saturday, March 7th, 2020. Um, he asked me what was my favorite restaurant. I said, Cheesecake Factory. Okay. <laughs> and so we agreed to go out um, at a Cheesecake Factory in a location that was in between. I lived in Clayton County at the time. He lived in Gwinnett County. I realized that if you don't know anything about Metro Atlanta, that makes no sense. I was excited. Like I called my friends and was like, I got a date, you know, blah, blah, blah. We'll see how it goes. First conversation was good. Um, hopefully he looks like his pictures because, you know, that's always an issue with online Ooh. dating. Hopefully he looks like his pictures. So on my way to our date, I took 285 and literally right before I got to Boulder Crest, the exit for Boulder Crest, I heard a boom and I lost control of my car. Thank God that this, well, not thank God, but I knew what to do. So I did not crash, but my tire blew out. So I called him and I said, hey, I'm so sorry, but my tire just blew on 285. I'm slowly making my way off the exit. I believe I pulled into a Chevron gas station and I said, you know, I got to get this fixed. I don't know what to do. Like I'm a damsel in distress kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He kind of paused. He got quiet and he was like, where, you know, tell me exactly where you are. Drop your pin. So I dropped the pin and he came to oh, no. the gas station, came to the gas station got out the car oh, no. and I was I was so relieved that he actually looked like his pictures that I was like oh my god he's actually a attractive he did tell me in the first phone call that he is that he was divorced um and that his ex-wife they had she had um two children a boy and a girl who were teenagers young adults I think the girl was about 20 and he said that he had a very close relationship with his stepkids um, but that he and his ex-wife had divorced because she cheated on him um, out in California. And so coming to Georgia was a new beginning for him. All right, now back to the tire blew out. So he shows up to the gas station. He changes my tire, which I just thought was the sexiest thing in the world. Ah, um, and then God, he proceeds. Dude, 
That sucks. I, I know how it is because I had a guy one time where I had bought a bed and it came in just way more pieces than I would have thought. Like you would think a bed is like a few of the big pieces, a few bolts and shoes. It came in shambles. And like I didn't have a bed for like a week. And I was like, oh, oh, oh. And then this guy came over, started putting the bed together, got a little hot. He took his shirt off and he's putting the bed together. And I'm like, I will marry you. <laughs> It's that simple. Change the tire, put the bed together, nail the door on. I don't know. I'm down. <laughs> like, And then he proceeds to say, hey, I found a, play, a tire place around the corner. You need to get another tire. Like, you can't drive on this donut. He followed me to the, to the tire place and then helped me get a tire, paid for it. So I was definitely like, wow. Um, and so the vibe was good. So anyway, I get the car, I get the tire fixed. We follow each other to the Cheesecake Factory. We hold hands walking into the Cheesecake Factory. So in my mind, I'm like, this is just this. Oh my God, I had butterflies. That that's that's the look of a woman who had butterflies. There's a long wait, and so we sit outside and we just talk, and the conversation's great. And this is where he tells me what it is he's looking for. Okay. He tells me, you know, I'm I believe at the time he was 42. He was like, I want to get married and it'd be for real. He's like, my parents were married 40 plus years before my mom passed away. And I want that. I want marriage, family, a house. Like that is what I want. He was like, I'm, you know, I'm as a man, I'm ready to get married, but I want it to be for real because the first time, you know, it really hurt me when she cheated on me. Is it a little too good to be true so far? Normal guy met on the Christian Facebook page, just got into town, you know, still in his kid's life, but doesn't mess with his ex. Will come rescue you when you got the flat tire. Will buy you a new tire. Tells you he wants something serious. Like, this is too good to be true. And I said pretty much the same thing. I was like, I'm ready to get married. Definitely want to have a family. And... <clears throat> I want to marry my best friend. So we both put on the table that we wanted marriage. And this is the end of part one. Oh, shit. Part two. The dinner at Cheesecake Factory went really well. We laughed. We joked. We talked about people, which um, <laughs> is kind of up my alley, my sense of humor. It was, just, it was a good vibe. So at the end of the day, or excuse me, at the end of dinner, we sat in his car and he played this song for me by John Legend. I don't no. know the name of the song by the well, by the time this video posts, I will put the name at the bottom. I can't remember the song. I just remember that Wait. John Legend was talking about I think Did she post what it was at the end here? I have to see. No, she didn't say what it was. One time a guy started playing Saint John in the car and I never talked to him again. I don't know why. Like I just like wasn't into it. I was like, Oh, you like this? I was like, We don't like the same music. <laughs> Oh, whenever I hear St. John, I think about just opening up that car door and tumbling out. I just remember that John Legend was talking about, I think I met my wife tonight. Ooh. And I thought it was a sign. So I was like, oh my God. So anyway, we ended up sitting in the car talking just about life and experiences until about midnight. So during this conversation, he again uh, is telling me- Nicole, first time chatter. I don't know why, but I trust her. Nicole said it's called Tonight by John Legend. I, I, I feel that one in my bones. Nicole, I'm trusting you. You know, what it was like living in California, how he went out there. He went to San Diego State. He played football for San Diego State. Um, he talked about how that's when he joined the company. Um, and then he explained that he also did arena football, but only did it for about two or three years. He claims that while he was doing arena football, the team that he was on won a championship. But again, keep in mind, I don't know anything about arena football. So I was like, okay, I didn't know they had championships. Still and he was like, you know, he got a little offended. Like, yeah, they got championships. And you know, he was on that team. We talked about all that. We talked about, uh, we talked deeply into what happened with the ex-wife It's because I asked. He was not volunteering all this information. So in other words, I, I get very- Of course we asked. Of course. I have to know, look, if it's just like an ex-girlfriend, we're not gonna have like a whole shit talking session. Maybe one time, maybe one time when I'm drunk, but you know, after that we'll move on. But if it's like an ex-wife, I have to know, I have to know what the deal is. We gotta know, I get it, I get it. I was asking questions okay. I was really trying to figure out, okay, is this a, are you ready for a relationship or are you still, um, missing her. So we talked about that. We talked about my exes. That was a mistake I made because I talked about how I dated at one point in time, somebody I worked with that will come back later. 
Um, and he seemed real cool about it. He was like, you know, that was before me and blah, blah, blah. Um, so the conversation was good. Midnight comes and um, I go home. Yes, I went home. And within about two and a half weeks, Brian Kemp, our governor, shut Georgia down. We were about to, we were going to be on lockdown. So during those two and a half weeks, we talked every day. We went out again at Red Lobster, but everything was going great. The issue was, where are we going to quarantine? Are we going to quarantine at his place? Quarantine has hit Georgia. Lockdown is coming and they're trying to figure out how are they going to quarantine together? Which he had like a studio type of situation. Like it clearly where he was staying. Um, I was like, it's like a studio apartment. Okay. But he kept telling me like, this is temporary because I'm looking for a house. Like he showed me the email from the, from a woman who worked at the company where she was out on maternity leave, but she was, she was putting him in contact <clears throat> with a realtor okay. to help him find a town home or a single family house. First mistake I made. Well, there's a lot, but this was a mistake I made. So ladies caution moment during one of our dates. Um, cause keep in mind in those two weeks, we were seeing each other quite a bit. Um, nothing physical or anything like that. Just two people who were, who I thought were really on some, all right, let's see if this is going, if this, if this is going to grow into something. He came to my house. When he came to my house, I had a three bedroom, two and a half bath townhome. He was in a studio. I did not realize inviting him to my home, um, probably made his eyes go oh shit she's a keeper she got this oh, three bedroom two and a half bath so townhouse well. and i'm in like a little studio yeah let me let me let me go ahead and pursue this what i, I feel like to i know where this is going yo is it just me con artist men are so fascinating to me i i i think it's i think it's so fascinating in la there's um forever hingers i've been here for like eight or like eight or nine years i've or seven years or so i've been on the different like dating apps and whatnot and there are people and, the, and you any of you guys that live in big city you've probably seen this where you get on the apps like once every few years but you'll get on and notice some of the same fucking people on there the same ones and so like i'll, I'll get I'll, I'll like when i first there are guys that I still see on like Tender or Hinge that I first saw when I got on the app. And like I was seeing them like year over year, like whenever I would slot in or whatever. And there was one guy in particular that was attractive. And I remember seeing him when I first got to L.A. And he was literally right up on the app until two years ago. And it's like, OK, maybe people have breakups and, you know, they hop in and out. But like these ones were a little funny, right? And I don't think I talked to him. There's like, you know, random people you match with and you don't talk to or whatever. But then. A couple months later, I end up seeing a YouTube video where a girl, God, I wish I could show this video, but it's like, it's like a little too close to home. But this, this girl basically did a whole expose on how she got tender swindled by the guy that I had, that I had matched with. And I had like seen him on the app for like five or six years. And I was like, oh my God, she was doing like a whole breakthrough about how like she was a YouTuber and she like had all this money and that he like came to her house one time and then his energy changed and then they became like a couple and like all this other stuff. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so it was a Tinder swindler 2.0, but the the male Tinder swindlers, honestly, like any con artist is just so interesting to me because they have different techniques to make you believe them. Let me go ahead and pursue this. What I need to do to quarantine here. The decision was made quarantine at my house. So, we the state went on lockdown. He came and stayed with me um in my home oh. and for the most part be in the initial beginning it was fine it was it was fine the reason why i hesitated because i grew in up together. in the church so for me it was really like an internal struggle of bruh you always said you would never live with a guy unless he was your husband and now you live in what to do and he ain't your husband like it was it was a struggle for me Ooh, okay question what do you think of this because on one hand it's crazy that they moved in together so soon like she said they hadn't even hooked up yet they only known each other for a few weeks they nothing's happened that sounds crazy for them to basically move in together for a temporary period of time but how do you feel given it was covid and this is like when you first are having that connection with somebody and it's like hey either you guys stay with each other or you don't get to see each other for like months 
sometimes it's that that spark you're like oh i don't want to leave this behind but i mean yeah it's it's pretty soon i had a dude shockingly i did not have a bad time during covid there was that one time that i had to accidentally call the hot paramedics that was during covid and that was really embarrassing but for the most part i think i just spent a lot of time by myself it wasn't that bad it was it was a struggle for me because i knew better and I, and don't come for me i'm just telling you the way i grew up it was like that it was not sitting right with me but at the same time i didn't want to quarantine by myself I did not want to. So there we go. Um, so he moved oh, in. We talked about the bills. Let me clear something up that I said in the other video where I said he paid all the bills. He paid all the household bills. He did not pay my car payment, my cell phone, or my car insurance. He paid the rent because my rent at the time was less than $1,000. When he's telling me that he's a regional manager, I was like, wow, okay, so you got money. Um, and so he paid, he paid all the household bills. So my check really was just taking care of me, myself and I, and I am not, this is where it's not gonna make me look good, but it's the truth. Okay. It was intoxicating to not have to worry financially about how to pay the bills. It was a wonderful feeling. And so I kind of pushed to the side the fact that, yeah, you shacking up because it's like, but your page, you don't have to worry right now. Like he's, he's taking care of all of april's bills before april even come and then we have a conversation about house is he still going to buy a house just for him or is Yuck. he going to buy a house where it's for us this is so because fresh we are going to try to no. make this thing work this is too be fast. official get married okay have a family no so the question it's too fast now it's too fast i understood the the wanting to believe in it all right until this moment and then him turning around and saying so bro you know what he said to her you know what he hit her with the so what are we what are we doing he did it so the decision was made let's start looking for a house for both of us oh my god remember he was already looking for a house no. for him but then he was like you know what we're together i plan to marry you let's look for a for a, a family home for the two of us he was like this is how much i was approved for that's when he showed me the chase paperwork um, it was a letter stating that he, and it had the chase emblem at the top. He showed me a letter stating that he was approved for 700. Oh, no. Oh, man. The cliffhanger. Come on, Risa. All right. Part three. Who the fuck did I marry? So this is when he showed me a letter from Chase with the Chase logo at the top uh -oh. stating that he had been approved for a mortgage for, excuse me, for a $750,000 mortgage or a $750,000 house so he was like we can't go over seven fifty. dollars and I said I remember asking him can you afford the mortgage on a $750,000 house because I know I can't this is when he explains to me I told you how I played arena football I invested my money really well so he said I have money that will help pay for the mortgage he was like we're good like I'm I financially I am okay um, he's like, that's why I'm able to get approved for $750,000 mortgage. Okay. So he told me that his money was in different savings accounts. He said he had an account with Chase Bank. He had an account with U.S. Bank. And he had an offshore account. This is what he told me. The offshore account, I was like, why? And he explained something about, oh, the U.S. <clears throat> excuse me, the U.S. imposes taxes on money when you have a certain amount in, in U.S. banks. He was like, so everybody knows that it's smart to have some money in an offshore account. Oh, shut Y'all, look, I live paycheck to paycheck. I, again, I was like, okay, that's whatever. Oh, no. I said, so you have the, so you have the money in offshore um, accounts to pay for to pay for a home. I'm also holding in my hand a letter from Chase saying that he was approved for seven hundred fifty thousand. So I went off of what I saw. So we contacted a realtor. I won't say his name, but man, if he ever ever sees this TikTok, I owe this man such an apology but we contacted a realtor in <clears throat> who was based in Cobb County because I was very adamant I wanted to move back to Marietta Smyrna area when you get a house they dig into everything a lot of these pre like if you get pre-approved for a mortgage you have to straight up log into your bank account and like the realtor can just see all your shit which like i hate but they can they literally can see where all of your money is and otherwise you have to show proof of it being in other places in order to get pre-approved um in cobb county georgia 
was fine with that. His whole attitude was, you know, you're going to be my wife, happy wife, happy life. Ooh. So we met a realtor. I, I would find houses that I wanted to tour. Keep in mind that um, this was COVID. It would, have to, it would have to be a virtual tour. So this particular realtor, we found a house in Douglasville, Georgia. Not Cobb County, but nevertheless, it's in Douglasville. Okay. The realtor did a, um, a, a, a FaceTime tour of the house. The house was, it was really a nice, it was a nice home. And the home was listed, I believe, roughly 400 and something thousand. So they were approved for up to 750,000. The house is 325. They should be good, right? He really liked the house. He was like, you know what? We'll put an offer in on the house. He was like, if you like it, because again, it was COVID. We weren't gonna be able to see the house in person because the family still live there. So he said, um, I'll put an offer in we'll see if it's accepted I said okay so he puts an offer in he's telling me he put an offer in I need to clarify some things he told me and the things that I actually saw so for this house in Douglasville he told me he was putting an offer in so the realtor was calling me and was like hey you know I'm I'm I put the offer in and what they're asking for um is proof of funds and I, and I know any I don't I did not know anything at this time about buying a house so I was like, hey, you probably need to talk to him hey, here's because I'm not even listed on the mortgage. Like from the paperwork I saw, it was only in his name. So he um, he called him. I guess they talked. I was not there, um, but I'm assuming that they had talked. So the boyfriend is coming. My ex is coming home saying, yeah, I talked to so-and-so. I sent him over the paperwork. The offer was approved. They are going to try to do a virtual closing. First, we got to do an inspection. If the inspection goes all well, then we okay. have to do a virtual closing. We're getting he pretty far also here. told me that he put down earnest money on the home. He put down, I believe, 5000 He said, I, I just transferred the money over to the realtor's uh, account or whatever um, so that it could be earnest money for the house. So I'm just like, okay, great. He was like, so realistically, this is April. We should be able to get in that house um, by June. About three or four days later, I get a phone call from the from the realtor, and the realtor is like, hey, I'm just checking to see what you know what you guys want to do about that house. So I was confused. I'm at work, um, and I said, oh, I, I was told that he put an offer in, and the realtor was like, he did. Oh, I didn't know that he put an offer uh, in. And I said, well, he told you he put in an know? offer. Like he told me he put the offer in and he um he had paid earnest money, five thousand dollars earnest money. And so the realtor was like, Well, let me call him and find out what's going on with that, because I didn't know anything about it. So red flag, of course. So I call him but and he's and he She probably doesn't think anything of it because she's like, Why would he lie about this? Uh uh. He flips the script. And he like goes off. He's like cussing going off like he shouldn't, excuse me, I have the hiccups. He shouldn't be calling you. If he has a question, he should call me mm -hmm. because I'm the one that's on a mortgage. He was like, and now it's, you know, it's gonna be an issue. And I said, well, did you put the offer in with him or not? And he said, no, I did not put the offer in with him. I put the offer in with a friend of mine who is a realtor <gasps> so I can give him the business. Oh, oh, <sighs> so, oh. Oh, that was the redirect with emotion when you confront something on somebody that that makes sense and then they either get really really angry or really really sad they're redirecting to that emotion rather than the topic at hand right so he gets all angry i never heard, i did not hear from that realtor again so i was just like is the house under contract or is it not he was like yes the house is under contract this is what this is how crazy things work out about three days later on realtor.com I'm looking at the house because I was trying to figure out in my mind how I'm going to decorate. It shows the house is under contract. Oh! So, show my boyfriend. My boyfriend's like, I told you it was under contract. <gasps> he was like, I, I, like, did you not believe me? No! And I ain't had a heart to say, hell no, I didn't is believe you. <laughs> like, it seemed him? too good to be true. Um, but red once flag, I saw the flag. house was under contract, I absolutely believe that, okay, this is under contract with him for, uh, for like, us yeah, we're about to do inspection we are about to move Girl. um and so we had driven by the house because again keep in mind a family still living there so we had driven by the house 
at this point he was like i want us to start looking for furniture so that way we can go ahead and order it so when, when it's time to move the furniture is ready because you know it takes like six to eight weeks so sometimes locked in. Um, for furniture to be delivered if they don't have it in stock like he was he was very methodical and planning and saying this is what we need to do so we started going to home, home depot lowe's um because we had a printout of what the sellers were going to take they were going to take the appliances he had a printout let me be clear he had a printout so it said on there that they were going to take the appliances here's where we get into the shopping oh my god he had her start setting all this stuff up knowing that the that they weren't up for the con he was ready to lie about basically what was next all right part four so we go to home depot we go to lowe's I'm choosing all these appliances. He's taking pictures of this of the um the SKU number. We have representatives helping us. Oh my god! And he basically oh my god, dedicated liar, dedicated liar. He take he taking pictures of the SKU numbers, not even the dimensions. Look, my man, if he was setting up the house, he'd be taking pictures of the dimensions, but he's taking pictures of the SKU number. Shut that. That's doing too much. I we have representatives helping us, and he basically explains to them, "Hey, we're we're Thank buying you, a house." Um, we should be closing sometime in June. Can we order this stuff now? Can I can I put a hold on it? Like, what can we do? Because <coughs> we're not ready for delivery. I stood there as the Home Depot rep said, we can hold it in our warehouse. Like, you can buy something and we can hold it. People do it all the time, especially with COVID. Okay. So I watched him pay. Um, I want to say it was about three or it was either three fifty or five hundred. I watched him pay a deposit on a whole new set of appliances. Wait, how much did he pay? Did she say three hundred or five hundred? I want to say it was about three or it was either three fifty or five hundred. I watched him pay a deposit okay. on a whole new set of appliances for them, and they were going to hold it until we were ready for delivery. I watched this. So we went all around rooms to go. We went to Ashley Furniture. We went to American Signature. And I I, I saw all these things that I wanted. Again, he's taking pictures of it. He was like, I can go online and order it. I didn't think anything of it because, again, I just saw that we held the appliances. So I was like, okay, that's, that's fine. May 2020 comes. Um, this is where things start to get a little okay. interesting oh oh may comes and so obviously we had not done inspection and i'm asking him all the time what's so what's the deal with the house he was like oh because of covid they're trying to get someone to do the inspection but the guy that they had it was always something the guy they had caught covid so they're going to have to get somebody else and he's like he's like 15 houses backed up so it'll be a while in this point in may of 2020 i started recording oh. um audio diaries what i don't know why I, it was some For something COVID? just made me just start recording my thoughts in an audio diary and i still have them so i was like i knew i knew there was something something was nagging me like mm. but i i kept pushing it out of my mind i was like you saw th this is what i reminded myself you saw him pay for the appliances you know the house is under contract you know that he told you that um he's the one who put the house under contract why would like i remember saying to myself why would he lie about that this is so easy to verify why would he lie about that have you caught him in any other lie and at the time the answer was no mm. um so i really was like maybe you just aren't used to a guy who actually does what he's supposed to do like i i was questioning myself and then answering my own questions so around mid-may I found out I was pregnant May 2020 when I found out I was pregnant he was ecstatic and I was like oh. oh shit the reason why I was oh shit is because number one I'm plus size number two because of my age I was I, I felt like it was probably gonna be a high-risk pregnancy um and I wasn't married and that nagged I cannot Ooh. tell y'all how much it nagged there was core. a lot of internal <coughs> struggle 
in between. My family didn't even know that he had moved in at this point. I told them, you know, that I was pregnant, um, went to the doctor, everything looked good. Oh my gosh. And guys, um, they, but again, they got together in like January, February, and it's only May now. They don't have the house. Oh my God, this is not good. And because it was COVID, he couldn't go in with me. Um, into the actual room so you know doing any sort of ultrasound doing the blood test because my hcg levels were really high so the doctor was like hey it might be twins we don't know yet um you're still kind of early you know along um they gave me a due date due date was january 26th of 2021 are the, doc wait, um, are the doctors telling the truth too are these his friends i mean i'm sure they are but it's just like i don't know what to believe here so there was now more of a push into we got to get a house we gotta yeah, get the fuck up out of here. I'm not having a baby in Riverdale. Okay, none against Riverdale, but I ain't having a baby in Riverdale. So we need we need to we need to find out what's going on with this house. And so he was very he was on top of it. He had an answer for everything. Um, he was like, you know, I'm gonna call and find out what's going on. Blah blah blah. Um, he then magically told me about a week later. Oh, they're gonna do inspection on the on the house like in two days. Once we get the inspection report back, then we will know what you know what we are going to be responsible for what, what are we getting ourselves into i guess they did an inspection he showed me an inspection report uh, um ooh, the only thing that they ooh, said that the roof he's always got the paperwork guys he's always got it had just recently been replaced which he i remember he was very happy about um and the issues that they that there were for the house were minor it was not it was not a bad because we did have a discussion about it he was like it's not it's nothing that we can't handle then he said that we were set to close um, the end of May. He told me it was going to be a virtual closing. You're probably like, what the hell is a virtual closing? Because again, he's saying because of COVID, people are not closing in the office. They're doing a virtual closing where um, you would need to electronically sign the paperwork. This is what he's telling me. And so he was like, we're set to close like just before Memorial Day. For some reason, I didn't start packing. I, anyone that knows me will tell you I hate moving. I've done it enough in my life. I hate moving. But I did not start packing up that house at all. I was just did like, you know? you know, I'm pregnant. My body was changing so fast that it was like I could barely keep my eyes open half the day. Um, and so, no, I didn't start packing. And I remember I did record. Again, I was recording audio diaries just about every day. Wait. When someone said it gets so much worse than some of y'all are guessing. What? When something didn't sit right, I would verbally record it in the audio diary because I was like, I don't know what it is, but there's something. That was the theme of our relationship. I don't know what it is, but I know there's something. I remember talking to myself in my little prayer closet because that's where I would do my recordings. And I remember thinking, what if he, what if we don't get this house? Like, what if we don't get, what if he's lying? But again, there goes that thought process of why would he lie about this? Like, who makes up oh my God. that they're buying a house when in fact they're not? Oh my God. And then he's showing you all this paperwork. Oh like, my come God. on, you can't be that jaded that you don't even believe what's in front of you. It wasn't a question about money. It was just a question of, are we really are we really about to move into this house? We were supposed to close before Memorial Day. Okay. We didn't. There was an excuse. There was always an excuse. Oh. Now. Always an excuse. And I didn't know enough about the process to question Shoot stuff it. because yeah. I really wasn't involved the way I should have been. And it was giving me a lot of anxiety. So I'm pregnant with a lot of anxiety. So we did not close around, we moved now into June. This is now going into June. Around June 5th, I looked at the house again on realtor.com. Uh oh. I don't know what made me do it other than, and I don't mean to sound super spiritual. I know that people are like, you know, you may or may not believe in God. A little bit of but Jesus. But I'm telling you, I believe with all my heart. A little bit of Jesus. Probably the Holy fine. Spirit was like, look at that house on realtor.com. That's fine. So I looked at the house well, on realtor.com. I mean it might have been the Holy Spirit, but also if I thought I was closing on a house, I'd probably be checking it week over week. So like, it's not that crazy, not that crazy, but what is on the other side? It showed that the house was off the market. Oh. And I remember being like, okay, wait, what, is, what does that mean? What, what does that mean? Because ex-husband is telling me, we're about to close on the house. We're about to close, it's our house. We got furniture, da-da-da, da-da-da, da-da-da. Um, he's also telling me, 
that he's been in contact with the realtor, his friend, who was oh, telling yeah. him, you know, this is what was happening next. Here's what's going on. So the guy that we initially worked with apparently is completely out of the picture. But again, I was not heavily involved. So it shows the name of the real estate agent for the seller. I called her and I said, you know, my, <clears throat> excuse me, I said, my husband and I, even though I wasn't married, my husband and I were looking at this house at 123 Main Street and we really wanted to tour it, but now I'm showing it's off market. Is it not available or, you know, I, I pulled that card and she was like, oh, no, ma'am. Um, the home closed yesterday. It closed June 4th. Again, there are certain dates I just remember. Oh uh, 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 pending sale. So this is when it was off market and then it's all listed for sale again. Do they not take it? Maybe there's something wrong with the inspection. I don't know. You house people know. And I said, oh, it closed June 4th. I was like, really? <laughs> um, <clears throat> oh, that's sad. She said, yes, ma'am. She was like, um, my, my sellers sold the house. And I was like, oh, man. Okay. Well, I said, my husband and I really wanted, you know, we love the pictures of it. And we're getting ready to start a family. So I would have loved to have been able to, you know, have the opportunity to see it. I asked her something. I don't remember the specific question I asked her. And I don't even, I, I know why I asked the question because I was anticipating that my boyfriend at the time was going to have some sort of excuse. So I asked her something about the buyers. And I remember, I, and somehow, again, forgive me, I don't remember the question I asked her. But the answer was that it was an older white couple. Oh. Older white couple. So I get off the phone with her. I record an audio diary. And in the audio diary, I specifically say, okay. There is no house. He's going to have to get out of this lie somehow. Because now I realize, at the very least, he was lying about him being the one who was under contract. And I was trying to think of ways on how he's going to do it. And something said to me, because I say it on the audio diary, I said, um, he's going to say it's a bad deal. And he's going to say he wants to pull out. Y'all keep in mind, oh. I am pregnant. So I had a decision to make. As ugly as this decision was, I made the decision, you're about to have a baby with this man. He's paying all the household bills. Let him get out of the lie. And that's what I did. I purposely made the decision that I knew he was going to come back. And I knew he was going to give me some bullshit on why he couldn't buy the house. Because he didn't know that I knew that house is already sold. Oh my God. Oh my god, oh my god, the oh my house god. is already sold. Oh my god. Um I, I would have And this is the part where out. I said, I'm gonna be honest, even though it's gonna make me look bad. Because most women in their right mind would have would have been like, I'm out. And I didn't. He came home. He didn't really say anything that day. The next day I asked him about the house. And he said, My friend, the realtor, um, he was like, I'm talking to him because something's going on with the interest rate and when he said that I felt so much relief because I knew that I had been prepared for he's gonna give you some bullshit so when he said uh -huh. there's something with the interest rate I said you know what if the int this is literally what I said y'all if the interest rate isn't good then we shouldn't move there we should probably ah! let this house go we should cancel he, and he said whatever furniture and he said yeah yeah, I agree. I think that sounds good. Well, on to the next one. It's okay. We can just stay in your house for a little bit, baby. <laughs> we should cancel whatever furniture we, we ordered or, you know, appliances. And let's just look for another house. I said, I would like to be moved before the end of the year. I said, I really don't want to be nine months pregnant moving into a house. I would like I would like to be done with this before then. And he was, he, the way I said it was so calm. And he was like, okay, he was like, I'm gonna call the friend, the realtor, and tell him I'm backing out of the house. Engagement ring? No, baby, I'm married to myself. It's just me. This is for me. I bought these for me. You should buy jewelry for yourself. And I'm gonna see if I can get my earnest money back. And I remember looking at him. I was standing in the kitchen and I cocked my head to the side and I said, okay, get your earnest money back. Ah! And let's find another house. <laughs> And so that's how that first house fell through. The next week, which is mid-June, I was at work. Um, 
and I started cramping. Oh no. Started bleeding. Um, and at this point, my doctor, I had just had an ultrasound earlier that day. So I went to work because the ultrasound was, was fine. I went to work and the cramping and the bleeding started. Oh no. And I started crying because I, I kind of knew what was going on. Oh my God, is she? Mystery? And um, my doctor had called me and told me that when they did the ultrasound, they did not see a heartbeat. So she was like, this pregnancy is not going to be viable. Oh. So I'm crying hysterical. And now we're going to get into part six. Yo, this story is legitimately crazy. And it's interesting because like a lot of us here have dealt with the psycho manipulative narcissistic people. <laughs> a lot of us have dealt with those types of people. So she's talking about the stressors of the home, the stressors of miscarrying, the stressors of dealing with people like this. But when you learn the ways that they uh, push your boundaries or violate your boundaries, and if you lay the boundaries down, and they don't step past it because sometimes the narcissist can be in your life long enough that they're like, OK, you know what? I'm not going to mess with this one. I, I, I'm This is so true. I like literally have to deal with this. Um, love them. Hate them. Love them. No, love them. Um, but if you just put the boundaries and the narky people stay away from it, then you can keep them. But if they're constantly pushing their bound your boundaries, they have to go. It's such a buzz where actually I don't even know if you guys noticed this. I don't say it as much i don't say it as much as you would think that i do considering a lot of the content that we talk about like i'll do a whole video and like a many of the person and sometimes not call them a narcissist you know what you know why because i think it's fucking played out when i say that i mean a manipulative person that is using tools to do what they want rather than what's best for the both of you right like that's essentially what i mean and we see a lot of people with those behaviors but Bro, do y'all ever be scrolling TikTok and like Instagram and see like the narcissist and that da 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 and, I, and it's like it gets so played out. I kind of hate the word now, bro. Gaslighting, it's a buzzword too. Th dude, this is why I talk so much because I'm roundaboutly saying the word narcissist or, <laughs> or gaslight because I hate them now. So this is part six where we left yeah, off. Yeah, I don't like any so mental disorder stigma. Um, my doctor had called and told That's me why I try. I don't heartbeat. talk about it too much. not viable at that point. I talk about and like I was CPTSD, which is spotting what I talk, I talk about. I know. So I obviously, um, my doctor had called and told me there was no heartbeat. The pregnancy was not viable at that mm. point. And I was cramping and spotting at work. Went into my best friend's office and immediately started crying. She was like, what's going on? Mm. And I said, um, I told her what the doctor said. And she grabbed her keys, grabbed her purse and was like, let's go. I'm taking you home. On my way home, I called my boyfriend and told him what the doctor said. And he was like, I'll meet you at home. So he was coming from Duluth, went straight home. About 24, 48 hours later, I had a doctor's appointment and my doctor gave me three options. First option, let everything happen naturally. Your body will expel the fetus on its own. Aww. Second option, you can take a pill, which will induce expelling the fetus at home. The pill basically will cause you to contract and expel. Mm. The third option was to go into the hospital and do a DNC. I did not want to do a DNC because I did not want to be in a hospital with COVID going on. Um, and for whatever okay, reason, also, I did not do the I, I have not personally experienced this before, but my best friend one time had to take the pill and I was live. Oh, it breaks my heart. I answered every call that day. I answered every text that whole day. And like, we didn't know anything about that like the way they present if somebody has to take a pill like in, even if it's after a miscarriage it's like oh you take a pill and it's fine that girl was in the worst fucking pain of her life if you have a friend that has to take a pill or if you're dating somebody and like your significant other miscarries or just has to take it for any reason I need you to take the whole fucking day off work so if you don't know please be there for your significant others or friends during that because it's very it's very sad and you want to be there for them for sure yeah they the make it sound let like it happen easy. naturally so i chose to do the pill his birthday was um june 17th my ex's boyfriend excuse me my ex's birthday was june 17th so the decision was made we're going to celebrate his birthday that day go out to eat um and then that night i would take the pill because we both were off from work the next two days next two or three days so um went out to eat to try to celebrate as best we could and then took the pill that night 
that night was the most traumatic, excruciating yep. thing I've ever put my body through. Um, yep. I do not recommend any woman, if prayerfully you don't have to go through that, but I don't recommend taking that pill. I couldn't take, they gave me a narcotic. I couldn't take it because it was, I found out I was allergic to it. So it was causing me to like projectile vomiting. Oh, wow. and it, it was a mess. So, um, and he was right there. You know, he was scared that he needed to take me to the ER. But in the morning, the pain kind of subsided. So about 72 hours later, I had another doctor's appointment where the purpose of this appointment was to do an ultrasound to see if everything had passed. Everything did not pass. So because of that, my doctor was like, we're going to have to do a DNC. Um, my DNC was scheduled oh for God. the first week of July. My boyfriend, my ex, was going to take me. Um, that was always the plan. She is going Two days through before, it my procedure he tells me he comes home and tells me that he is up for promotion he's up to he's up to be promoted to vp because of this the president of the company <coughs> excuse me is coming in and it was going to be this huge business meeting he had to go to um the business meeting was scheduled for the day of my surgery and so i'm just i'm i'm throwing a fit because i was like you you know you you there's no way you can do that meeting like i need you to take me to the hospital and all this other stuff and so he offered to have his sister take me to the hospital um apparently his sister lived in douglasville i was like no because i've never met her like i'm not i know i'm not having a stranger take me to the hospital no this is a private situation i don't want to do that blah 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 so my aunt was going to had offered to take me and then my friend who took me home from work had offered to take me we get into an argument because he's like my sister is you know you, you about your family so why can't she step in and i was like no nah, because i don't know her period i don't know her Ooh. so Ooh. my friend offers to take me to the hospital because i was all distressed that he's saying he has a business meeting and he can't take me so i remember being on i-75 <laughs> on the connector on the phone with her crying because I, I was so embarrassed that he wasn't going to be the one to take me and that I was needing to rely on someone else to take me to the hospital in order to get a DNC done. And wow. she was really great. She was like, girl, this is why you have a village. Like, it's okay. Things happen. The world is crazy right now. I will take you. You're going to be okay. So when they wheeled me into pre-op after I got checked in, I texted him and was just letting him know, hey, here's the update. I'm about to, you know, I'm in pre-op. They're going to get me prepared to go back um, to the surgical ward or whatever. And the response I got was from yeah, his new executive assistant named David. Now, when he told me he was up for the promotion, he did tell me that part of getting this new job would be that he would get an executive, uh, executive assistant named David. And he did tell me, I'm going to make sure that I inform David if you get a text from this number, meaning from me. Um, pull me out of the meeting because, you know, she's my fiance is having um, a procedure done and I'm picking her up. So it's important that you come get me Wait. if there's something serious. What if he's lying about his job? Because like I'm getting I'm getting broke boy vibes from this, but he keeps paying for stuff. So I text him. David responds. He said, yeah, Mr. Blah Blah told me that um you are having a procedure done. If you need me to get him, I can go get him. He's in a meeting. Just let me know what you need. Oh my God, this and is I just said, no, don't bother him. I'm just giving an update that they're about to take me back. And David responds and says, I'm so sorry you're going through this. Please let me know if there's anything I can do. Who's so like his I have assistant? the procedure. I wake up and I am now in recovery. I should be in recovery 45 minutes up to an hour and a half. I wake up. First thing I ask, and I remember asking is where is so-and-so the nurse who was so sweet you know she was like everything went well um you're doing great she said we spoke to your fiance he's on his way so i hear her talk to the other nurse and that's when she said yeah um dr so-and-so called her fiance and his executive assistant picked up and the executive assistant said that he was in a business meeting and that um you know you could relate to him what you need to say and he'll you know tell mr he'll tell the fiance and my doctor was like hell no <laughs> hipaa um i need to speak to him so apparently my fiance called the doctor back about 30 minutes later and the doctor informed him she'll be ready to be discharged in about an hour nervous. you know you can make your way and come pick her up he said he was on his way he was on his way from Duluth to Atlanta, which is not a huge distance, but the time of day, one thing about Atlanta, there's always traffic. He should have been there within the hour. 
I should have only been in recovery an hour and a half. Let's go to the next part. What? What's hey the next part? Don't leave us hanging, girl. Part seven. Ooh, I got my full screen. We're just going right into it, everybody. Subsequently, I ended up being in recovery between three to three and a half hours. The nurses kept calling my ex asking what's the status because they were actually getting ready to do a shift change so they kept calling asking what's the status what's the status like where are you i want to say that they called a total of three times and they spoke to him twice um so at this point i knew that they were all like where is her where is her fiance like what is going on um he said he was stuck in traffic and so he was making his way there he eventually did get to Northside Hospital um, and they wheeled me down because, um, again, he couldn't come in um, just because of the protocols. So when I got in the car um, and I'm in pain, but I remember him calling my aunt and my mother and letting them know I picked her up. We're on the way home. Let me get her settled and then um, I'll give you guys an update. I remember that. What I did not know was that he had text my aunt and my mom and asked them to not bother me for what? like a week like just please don't reach out to her let her just rest i am from new jersey i am from an african-american family that's weird you don't tell my black mama or my black aunt Ooh. that um you not know please don't bother for her for a week, week. yeah <laughs> that's crazy i didn't know this at the time but i'm just interjecting that part i'm trying to stay in the timeline but um he he did apparently do that and my aunt was like why well, will fuck you up anyway he waits on me hand and foot i recover um just needed about 20 it's a little isolating he wanted him to be the only person that she leaned on during this really difficult time during this time in between the when the house in Douglasville fell um, fell through, we had not talked about a house. So I guess it was about a week later after the DNC, he decides that, do you want to start looking for a house again? Because of what happened with the house in Douglasville, I felt like I was smarter this time to say, you know, I want to be involved in every aspect because I don't know what the fuck happened with that house in Douglasville. But what I do know is that he, he lied to me. I didn't think, I, I didn't know then what I know now. I told him, I said, I don't want to work with your friend who I've never met, never talked to. Yep. I know that he has talked to him because he's talked to him in front of me. And I'm going to demonstrate on one of the videos how he used to do his phone calls. Don't worry, it's coming. So we found a new real estate agent. His name was Scott. I am using his real name. Really nice guy. Try to look for houses that are empty because you can actually tour those. If it's a house where someone's already living in there, chances are it's going to have to be a virtual tour because of COVID. What? You're not ready, Bose. So what do you mean? I'm not ready. What's about to happen? So I found a house um, that I absolutely, in total, we must have looked at about 15 houses. Wait. Mutha said, Bose, help. I can't hear you over my shower. Bro, you're telling me you're sitting here right now on your phone, with your cheeks out, in the shower, shower running. You got me on the Bluetooth speaker outside and you just you you just sitting out here with your cheeks out, sending little messages like, hee hee, Bose, talk louder. But I found a house in Smyrna that I okay. absolutely loved. Wait. We toured the house. How much is that house? That one say it was 900,000? About 15 houses. Um, but I found a house in Smyrna. Seven beds. Oh my God, he got money like that? Okay. We toured the house. Everything about this house was perfect. The house was listed for 699,000. It was a brand new construction build. The only issue was that the basement was not finished and he wanted the basement to be his man cave. Um, again, I went with him to tour this house. So this was already feeling very different than the situation in Douglasville because we did not actually tour the Douglasville house. We only did a FaceTime um, virtual tour. This house in Smyrna, we toured. We toured this house more than once. He said that he had the money. He said he felt comfortable putting in an all cash offer. All cash offer on a $700,000 house. I was gonna say a second ago, y'all, if, if a house is, is, is 700,000, you gotta put 20% down. So, you know, he'd be putting down, you'd have to put down like 160K. That's a lot of money. And then after that, he's paying $5,000 a month. And he said, oh, I'll just pay the full 
full amount. 700k ha in cash if you got 700k in cash well baby let's get a two million dollar house let's put down 350. <laughs> he told me he had money in his savings from when he played football no so when he said an all cash that's a offer, lot of football even i knew you what? Oh, oh. you got that kind of money no. like where you can cut a cashier's check for 699,000. and i've been paying and he told me he did hey if you got 700000 in the bank just chilling back there and I've been paying diddly squat for the last three months, I don't want to pay for a single dinner, a single parking meter. I don't even want to put my own shoes on. You got $700,000. This is, guys, this is, this is big. And he and, told me he did. And we might fuck around and get married he right now. He had money in savings um, from when he played football and he was uh, very comfortable paying all cash for this home. What? No, she's ready for so, to lie again. The real estate agent, Scott, sent over the paperwork. The paperwork was sent in both of our names. It was sent to my email. Um, that was another thing that I changed after Douglasville. Everything gets sent to me. Oh. And then I will be sure that he signs it. So he sent it to me. I looked over the offer. Um, we were asking, excuse me, we were going to put in an all cash full price offer with um, a request to have the basement finished. Also, we were requesting for the seller to give us an answer within 24 hours. And then also a quick closing because it was a, a new construction. So we didn't have to wait for the current tenant to move out. We didn't have to do that. So I watched in our bedroom as he pulled it up because it was a electronic document. He signed his name to the offer for $699,000 cash. Okay. He re requested again, the seller let us know in 24 hours if they were accepting the offer. So we submitted the offer at around 6 p.m. We were requesting that by 6 p.m. the next day, they let us okay. know if the offer was accepted or not. Ah! I watched him sign the offer. Okay. I sent the offer back to Scott from my email. Okay. All parties had signed. Scott texted us and said, I got it. I'm submitting it. I will let you know what they say. Let's go in to part seven. Oh my God, dude. Sorry. Let's go into part eight. She is leaving us on some crazy cliffhangers, always right at the 10 minute mark. So we've put in the offer for the house and this time we're going to get it. So we submitted an offer on the house in Smyrna. I sent it over to Scott, our realtor. And next day comes, Scott asks if we can take a phone call. So he calls us and tells us that the offer was not accepted and <gasps> the builder did not do a counter offer. What? We don't exactly know um, why he didn't accept it, but the bottom line is that we figured out later on that he didn't want to finish the basement. So okay. the offer was not accepted. The house fell through. I was okay with that because... Again, I knew he had put in an offer. So we continued looking at other houses. We found wow, another house. Wow, that lets him get away with it because she she might believe he lied about the other house. But I think she thought like, okay, maybe he really has this $700. Like she probably thought he wouldn't sign a contract that said he would give $700,000 if he didn't have it right house um in smyrna that he really liked um i thought that it was way too big for just the two of us um and so the price of this home was much higher than the seven hundred and fifty thousand that chase had approved for the mortgage so what he explained to me was that he was willing to do the seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar mortgage and he was also willing to put a significant amount of the money and savings on the house, which meant that he was now comfortable going from seven hundred and fifty thousand up to about nine hundred thousand. Again, <laughs> well, his mo listen. Hey, we may as well truck it on up to a million because I'm the kind of girl that I wouldn't mind saying that my husband just bought us a million dollar house. If we can go from three hundred to seven hundred to nine hundred, but let's go all the way up. <laughs> His whole explanation was, I have the money where I can put down a substantial down payment, bring down the price of the home, Why and then basically mortgage cool the rest bill. of it. So that was now the plan. I was not comfortable with a home <laughs> over $900,000. Mm -hmm. um, but again, keep in mind, I saw the Chase paperwork. So I was like, I just feel more comfortable sticking at the 750000 mark. Okay. That's what you were approved for. Let's go with that. By this point, this is now fall of 2020. Um, 
we had been talking about marriage. I had my ring. Um, he had made VP at the company. And again, he was calling me every day from work. Um, okay. The, I need to kind of explain how the company was ran. Because Wait, when you think VP, you was... would think he would be. In yeah, I was going to say she said he was VP. OK, we did say in chat earlier, like that's executive level money. But is it really like even on a three hundred thousand dollar salary? It was a condiment company. So they actually were producing the condiments. And I'm not saying the name of the company on purpose, but they were producing the condiments um, in this particular plant location. So a lot of times he would simply tell me that he walked the floor um, checking in with his subordinates, basically. Now, mm. how did he go to work? For the most part, at this point, he left before I woke up. However, pretty much he wore dress pants, um, kind of like a, deep, a dark navy blue cargo pant. And he had a polo shirt with the company logo on it. What I saw a lot of times is that he would not wear the polo shirt to work. He would wear like a company t-shirt. He would wear rubber sole shoes and the um, navy blue cargo pants navy blue cargo pants non-slip shoes and a t-shirt <laughs> it sounds like what i wore back in 2010 in the grocery store in the back of house i didn't think it was a uniform but it definitely it reminded me of what someone would wear when i worked at amazon if you're going to be doing manual labor <gasps> He didn't go to work sloppy looking at all, but it definitely was not suit and tie. Nowhere near suit and tie. Oh. Um, it is fair to note that outside of work, he was a man who he loved to dress. He loved to wear the latest Jordans. He loved to collect watches. He collected a lot of Invicta watches. Um, he he loved to collect hats. He wore hats, baseball caps everywhere because he didn't like the shape of his head. Um, Wink, thanks so for the raid. in terms of how he dressed casually, the man, he could dress. Um, in terms of how he dressed for work, yeah, he didn't dress like a VP. But his excuse was, I'm constantly walking the production floor and I can't be in a suit and tie walking the production floor where they're creating the condiments that we're selling. So by this point, again, this is fall. We're still looking at houses. Um, we're still touring houses as much as we can because it is COVID. Um, we had found another house that we really liked and a house that I really truly wanted to put an offer in on. This was now gonna be the second house that we put an offer on. He put in the the asking price, I believe was about 700,000. He put in under asking um, an offer for about 650,000. I'm guessing, but I'll try to find the house and put it on this and put it on the story um the reason that that house fell through we found out that the home was sitting on a septic tank we found out that the septic tank had an issue and it would have taken about 15 to twenty thousand dollars to fix the septic tank the sellers were not willing to fix the septic tank personally i didn't really care for the house that much i'm the one who was like i don't really want it so even though we put an offer in we had 24 hours where we could uh pull our offer back and so we did. Once we found out, I believe it was in the disclosure. And if you're a realtor, please feel free to tell me if I'm using the wrong terminology. But I believe it was in the disclosure that they told us the septic tank needs to be replaced. House number two fell through. Um, we then moved on, saw a few more houses, and then we get to house number three. I'm going to pause talking about the houses okay. because now I need to introduce what happened with the cars. What? <laughs> Would you be a top oh or bottom? Oh my god, dude. <laughs> That's a hilarious clip for it to play next. <laughs> Not you guys answering the next up TikTok. <laughs> so when I met my ex-husband, I was driving a 2012 Nissan Rogue. Oh god. Um, fully loaded. It had quite a few miles on it, but it, it got me from A to B. It was in a, it was in good condition, okay. but I was upside down in the car. Hey, hey. He was know, driving. Don't knock the Nissans. We we had some of us we had our Nissans going for years and years and years and years. The Nissan don't quit, baby. He was driving a 2018 Ford Taurus. Okay. Um super, uh sport mode. I know he had a sport mode on the car and I love driving Ooh. that car. Um when he uh oh the Ford Taurus sport mode. <laughs> told me how he was a regional manager he told me that one of the perks that came with the job was that he would be getting a company car 
And uh, so we spent time going to Range Rover of South Atlanta. Um, we spent time going to Jaguar. We spent time going to BMW. We spent time going to uh, Ford, which was on Mount Zion in Morrow, if you all are familiar with that area. He test drove a whole lot of cars. In the end, he decided on a BMW sedan. I was there when he test drove the car. I got in the car with him. I loved it. Um, and he explained to the salesperson, you know, I'm getting a company car. I need to get a printout of the full price of the car, tax tag and title. Because what my company is going to do is wire over the money for the car. The salesperson was like, okay, you know, apparently, apparently that happens a lot. So he gave him a printout with a tax tag and title for the car. Um, in front of me and the salesperson, he called the person in the finance department for his job. Okay. Obviously, I have no idea what this person's name oh is. Oh, my God. But he called the person. He explained to them, this is the amount of money. He said the president of the company, so-and-so, has authorized for him to get a car, not spending more than, I think, 90000 tax tag and title. The BMW came out to just under $90,000. Um, and so he, I remember this conversation so fucking vividly so he's, he's on the phone in front i'm saying i'm sitting down the salesperson sitting down at their desk and he's like they, you know they put me on hold and so he's like he i guess the person comes back and he says um yeah the, the price of the car is blah 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 he was like give me a second and i can send you a picture of that printout that shows tax tag and title for the bmw he gets off the phone he takes a picture of it he sends it to whoever he waits about 10 minutes. He calls the person back. He okay. says, did you get it? Apparently the person did get it. What? But the person who can who can actually physically do the wire transfer had gone home for the day. No. So what he says to um, the BMW salesperson, he's like, okay, we're going to have to do this tomorrow because so-and-so went home for the day. Oh. I don't know who the salesperson is. Oh. I can only tell you from my viewpoint what I thought. I had no reason to think this was a lie. I really did it because again, you got to keep, please keep in mind the circumstances that all of this is happening. Thanks, We're man. inside the dealership. We're sitting at the desk of this person. He gave us the printout. He's on the phone, do, you know, doing business, basically saying, look, I need, this is how much money the car is going to cost. He's taking a picture of it. He seemingly is texting someone saying, this is how much, you know, this is proof of how much it is. Then he asked the BMW salesperson, I need your wire transfer information. The guy got up, rushed over to, I guess their finance area to uh. get the wire the bank wire information because obviously you have to wire it a certain kind of way rushes back over gives it to my ex-husband my ex-husband's like okay first thing in the morning we will get this wired over and then you know i'll come and pick up the car my fiance me will drive me up here to pick up the car he felt like because at the time that this all happened i was pregnant so he felt like look we're about to have a oh, baby i don't want you driving that, that nissan rogue i want to get you something i want to get you something more secure something new I really wanted a Kia. <laughs> I really wanted a Kia Telluride. Um, and he was like, well, let's let's look at the warranty. This man knew a lot about cars. He knew a lot about the warranty. He knew a lot about the depreciation value. And so he did talk to me a lot about what will we get the most for our money. I test drove a Kia Telluride, a okay. Kia Sorento. Up, it's about he didn't like 000. either of those. He had me test drive a Ford Explorer. He didn't really care for that. Then came time where he really wanted me to get a BMW. Um, he really wanted me to get a BMW X5. So he took me to B Global BMW Imports, which if you know anything about Atlanta, it's off of Cobb Parkway, but you can see it off of set, uh, off the highway. I believe 285 is where you can see the Global Imports BMW dealership. He took me there. He had me test drive an X5 and X6. So he was very adamant that I should get a BMW. The reason being is because according to him, he had a BMW in California when he lived in San Diego. He had a BMW that he loved. It was a white BMW. He showed me pictures of the BMW. Okay. So he showed me pictures of this white BMW that he had. And unfortunately, the car got totaled about two months before he moved to Georgia. So he had received um, money, not a lot, but some money to get another car. And he used it to get the Ford Taurus because he was like, I just need a car that's gonna get me from A to B until I get into a house and I'm much more settled. For him, he was like, I'm really giving myself 60 days to get settled here in Georgia after moving from California. But then he met me. Again, that's the story. 
So okay. yeah, I test drive the BMW. So much so, I loved the BMW. The BMW loved it. I wanted a dark blue BMW with cognac interior. I wanted an X5, and I wanted Damn. an X series. Yo, hold on. She living her best life because before this, she said she had a townhome that cost like she said it was under a thousand. So it's like probably eight hundred or nine hundred dollars a month. That's like. That, that's like an average rent price. She was just she was just renting, you know. We we be renting for what seven hundred to like twelve hundred dollars a month, depending on where you live, big cities. Now she looking at nine hundred thousand dollar houses. Husband gonna pay for it outright in cash. She wants the BMW with the cognac interior. Like this is like kind of whiplashy for her in just a few months. Like this guy is taking her over here into this world and saying like, hey, look, we can have anything. I got the money and why would you not believe it if that's what was in front of you we were online looking for that particular car because not every dealership had it i was okay with a black bmw if needed um but i really wanted dark blue and i really wanted that cognac colored interior so he felt like i want you to still i want you to consider all of a sudden an audi q8 let's just see how you like it if you don't really like it then we will go back to the bmw I cannot tell you why he switched up. I can't. Um, but I can tell you he took me to an Audi dealership on Peachtree Industrial. He test drove an Audi and I test drove an Audi Q8. Um, I loved the Q8. Loved it, loved it, loved it. But oh I was God. tired of test driving cars. By this point, I had test, dri test driven so many cars. Um, our weekends were spent either looking at a house or test driving cars. <gasps> And oh. I was picky, I will admit that. So he had me test drive the Q8. I really liked it. I finally just told him, look, I'm good with either the BMW or the Audi. This is so disorienting. Because I'm, I'm tired of test driving cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He told my family he was buying me a new car because it, keep in mind, he had, well, not keep in mind, let me let y'all know. He had met my family initially on Zoom because, again, we were locked down. He had met my family. Oh my um, God. He also had met my family in person because at this point it was like, look, if you're not showing any symptoms, maybe we can do family dinner. Um, and so we had. So he had met my family in person. And now we will go ahead and move towards part 10 of this series. God, dude. And she's just like, oh, the cars are getting me because he's just juggling her between week over week of what's next. But guys, that's it for now. If you want to watch the rest of this saga, uh, it is on Risa Tisa's page on TikTok. It's it's long, but we've gotten through 10 parts so far and I'm invested. I'm super invested.